Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax Part 2 The man who came in was the same violent person who had attacked me in the street. He did not look pleased when he saw me. I received your letter, Mr. Holmes, he said. But why is this man here? In what way can he be connected with the affair? This is my old friend, Dr. Watson, replied Holmes. He is helping us in this case. The stranger held out his large brown hand. I am very sorry about what happened, Dr. Watson, he said. When you blamed me for hurting Francis, I lost all my self-control. I am in a terrible state, you know. I don't understand this affair at all. And Mr. Holmes, I don't even know who told you of my existence. I have spoken to Miss Dobney, Lady Francis's old nurse, Holmes said. Old Susan Dobney with the funny hat, said Green. I remember her well, and she remembers you. She knew you in the days before you went to South Africa. Ah, I see that you know my whole story. I will not hide anything from you, Mr. Holmes. I have loved Francis all my life. When I was a young man, I made a few mistakes and got into trouble, and she was always so pure and good. So when somebody told her how I was living, she refused to speak to me again. But she certainly loved me. She loved me well enough to remain single. I stayed in South Africa for many years, and I became rich there. When I came back to Europe, I decided to find her, to try to persuade her to marry me. I found her in Lausanne, and I think I almost persuaded her, but her will was strong. The next time I went to her hotel, I was told that she had left town. I tracked her as far as Baden-Baden, and then after a time I learned that her servant was here. I am a rough sort of person. I have had a rough sort of fight, and when Dr. Watson spoke to me, as he did, I became quite wild for a moment. But Mr. Holmes, tell me what has happened to Lady Frances. We will do our best to find that out, said Holmes in a serious voice. What is your address in London, Mr. Green? You can send letters or messages to the Langham Hotel, I think you should return to London, Holmes said. I may need you. I promise you that everything possible will be done for the safety of Lady Frances. Here is my card with my address on it. Now, Watson, while you are packing your bag, I will send a telegram to Mrs. Hudson. I will ask her to prepare a good dinner for two hungry travelers at half past seven tomorrow evening. At home the following evening, we found a telegram for Holmes on our table. Torn from injury was the message, which came from Baden-Baden. What does this mean? I asked. It is the answer to a question about Dr. Schlesinger's ear. You may remember my telegram. You did not answer it. I thought it was a joke. Really? Well, I sent the same message to the manager of the English hotel. This telegram is his answer. An important answer, Watson. Very important. What does it prove? It proves, my dear Watson, 
that we are dealing with a clever and dangerous man. His name is Henry Peters, or Peters the Priest, from Adelaide in Australia. He is one of the most evil men in the world, Watson. He is specially skillful at robbing lonely ladies by making use of their religious feelings. He is helped in this by a friend of his, a woman called Annie Fraser, who pretends to be his wife. I suspected that Dr. Schlesinger was really Mr. Peters. The matter of the torn ear makes it quite certain. And how did Peters the priest get his torn ear? I asked. He was hurt in a fight at an Adelaide hotel, Holmes replied. It happened at about six years ago. Well, Watson, poor Lottie Francis, is in the hands of a terrible pair. Perhaps she is already dead. In fact, that is quite likely. If she is still alive, she is certainly a prisoner somewhere. She is unable to write letters to Miss Dobney or to anybody else. I believe that Lady Francis is here in London, where it is easy to keep a person, a prisoner in complete secrecy. After dinner, I will go along to Scotland Yard and speak to our friend Lestrade. But the police did not manage to discover anything. The three people we wanted to find had completely disappeared. We advertised in the newspapers, but that failed. The police watched all Peters, the priest's old friends, but he did not visit them. And then, suddenly, after a week of waiting, something happened. A piece of old Spanish jewelry, made of silver and diamonds, had been received by a pawnbroker in Westminster Road. The man who brought it in was a large man who looked like a priest and gave a name and address which were clearly false. The pawnbroker had not noticed his ear, but we were sure that the description was that of Peters the priest. Philip Green had already come to see us twice, anxiously hoping for news. The third time he came, we were able to tell him something at last. Peters has taken some of Lady Francis's jewelry to a pawnbroker's shop, Holmes told him. We are going to catch him now. But does this mean that any harm has come to Lady Francis? asked Green. Holmes gave him a very serious look. If Peters and Annie Fraser have kept her a prisoner until now, they cannot set her free without danger to themselves. I fear the worst, Mr. Green. Please give me something to do, Mr. Holmes, said Green. Do these people know you? asked Holmes. No. Peters will probably go back to the same pawnbrokers when he needs money again. I will give you a letter to the pawnbroker and he will let you wait in the shop. If Peters comes in, you must follow him home, but you must not let him see you, and of course you must not attack him. Please do nothing without telling me. For two days, Green brought us no news. Then, on the evening of the third day, he rushed into our sitting room, pale and trembling with excitement. We have caught him, he cried. We have caught him. He was so excited that he could hardly speak. Holmes pushed him into an armchair. Please, Mr. Green, he said, tell us what has happened. She came into the shop an hour ago. It was the wife this time, but the piece of jewelry she brought was just like the other. She is a tall, pale woman with eyes like a rat's. That is the woman, said Holmes. She left the shop and I followed her. She walked up Kennington Road, then she went into another shop. Mr. Holmes, it was an undertaker's. I could see the shock on Holmes's face. Go on, he said, forcing himself to speak calmly. I went in too, said Green. She was talking to the undertaker inside. I heard her say, it is late. The undertaker replied, it has probably arrived by now. It took longer than an ordinary one would take. Then they both stopped and looked at me. So I asked the undertaker the way to Waterloo Station, and then left the shop. You have done well, Mr. Green, said Holmes. Very well. And what happened next? The woman came out. I had hidden in the doorway of another shop. I think she was suspicious of me, because I saw her looking round for me. Then she called a carriage and got in. 
I managed to get another and so to follow hers. She got out at 36 Pulteney Square in Brixton. I drove past, left the carriage at the corner of the square, and watched the house. Did you see anyone? asked Holmes. There was only one light on, in a window on the ground floor. I could not see in. I was standing there wondering what to do next, when a cart stopped outside the house. Two men got out, took something out of the cart, and carried it up the steps to the front door. Mr. Holmes, it was a coffin. Ah. For a moment I thought of rushing into the house. The door had been opened to let in the men with the coffin. It was the woman who had opened it. But as I stood there, she saw me. I think she recognized me. I saw her face change, and she closed the door immediately. I remembered my promise to you, and here I am. You have done excellent work, said Holmes. He wrote a few words on a half sheet of paper. Please take this note to Mr. Lestrade at Scotland Yard. We need to search the place and he will arrange everything. There may be some difficulty, but the matter of the jewelry is good enough proof of some crime, I think. But Francis may be murdered before then, said Green. That coffin must surely be for her. We will do everything that can be done, Mr. Green. We will not waste any time. Now, Watson, he said as Green hurried away. To me, the situation seems so terrible that we must act now without the help of the law. You and I are the unofficial police of London. We must go to Pulteney Square immediately. When we were in the carriage, traveling at high speed over Westminster Bridge, Holmes gave me his views on Peter's the priest's plans. These evil people have persuaded this poor lady to dismiss her servant and to come to London with them. If she has written any letters, they have been stolen and destroyed the criminals have rented a house, they have made her a prisoner, and now they have taken possession of her jewelry, the original reason for their interest in Lady Francis. Already they have begun to get money for it from the pawnbroker. They do not know that she has friends who are tracking them. They cannot set her free, and they cannot keep her a prisoner forever. So they must kill her. That seems very clear, I said, and the arrival of the coffin proves, I fear, that she is already dead. Oh, Watson, there is the undertaker's, I think. Stop, driver. Will you go in, Watson? Ask the undertaker when the Pulteney Square funeral is going to take place. The man in the shop told me that it was arranged for eight o'clock the next morning. When I reported this to Holmes, he looked unhappy. I can't understand it at all, he said. Murderers usually bury the body in a hole in the back garden. These murderers seem to fear nothing. We must go forward and attack Watson. Are you armed? I have my stick, at least. Well, well, we shall be strong enough. We simply cannot afford to wait for the police. Thank you, driver. You can go. Holmes rang the bell of a great dark house in the center of Pulteney Square. The door was opened immediately by a tall woman. Well, what do you want? She said rudely. I want to speak to Dr. Schlesinger, said Holmes. There is no Dr. Schlesinger here, she answered. Then she tried to close the door, but Holmes had put his foot in the way. Well, I want to see the man who lives here. I don't care what he calls himself, he said firmly. She thought for a moment. Then she pulled the door wide open. Well, come in, she said. My husband is not afraid to see any man in the world. She closed the door behind us and took us into a sitting room on the right of the hall. Before she left us, she turned up the gaslight in the room. Mr. Peters will be with you soon, she said. Almost immediately, a man entered the dusty sitting room. Peters the priest was a big man with a large, fat, red face, who would have looked pleasant if he had not had such a cruel mouth. You have surely made a mistake, gentlemen, he said in an oily voice. I think you have come to the wrong house. If you tried further down the street, perhaps... You are wasting your breath, said my friend. My name is Sherlock Holmes. You are Henry Peters, of Adelaide formerly Dr. Schlesinger of Baden-Baden and South America. 
I am not afraid of you, Mr. Holmes. What is your business in my house? I want to know what you have done with Lady Frances Carfax, who came away with you from Baden-Baden. I would be very glad if you could tell me where she is, Peters answered calmly. She borrowed nearly a hundred pounds from me and has not paid it back. All I have until she pays her debt is some almost worthless jewelry. I paid her hotel bill at Baden-Baden and I bought her a ticket from there to London. We lost her at Victoria Station. If you can find her, Mr. Holmes, I shall be very grateful to you. I am going to find her, said Sherlock Holmes. I am going to search this house until I do find her. Holmes took out a gun from his pocket. So you are a common thief, said Peters. That is right, and my friend Watson is also a dangerous man. We are now going to search your house together. Peters opened the door. Call a policeman, Annie, he called out. We heard the woman run across the hall and go out through the front door. We have very little time, Watson, said Holmes. If you try to stop us, Peters, you will certainly get hurt. Where is the coffin that was brought into this house? Why do you want to look at the coffin? Peters asked. It is in use. There is a body in it. I must see that body. I refuse to show it to you. But Holmes had pushed him out of the way. We went together into the next room. It was the dining room of the house. The gas light was burning low, but we saw the coffin immediately. It was on the table. Holmes turned up the gas and opened the coffin. Deep down at the bottom there was the body of a small, very thin, and very, very old woman. It was certainly not Lady Frances Carfax. Thank God, whispered Holmes. It is someone else. You have made a bad mistake, haven't you, Mr. Holmes, said Peters, who had followed us into the room. Who is this dead woman? asked Holmes. You have no right to ask, but I will tell you. She is my wife's old nurse, Rose Spender. We found her in a hospital for old people in Brixton and brought her here. We called in a Dr. Horsum. Yes, please write down his address in your notebook, Mr. Holmes. It is 13 Burbank Street. He took good care of her, but on the third day, she died. She was 90 years old, after all. The funeral is to be at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. The undertaker is Mr. Stimson of Kennington Road. I am going to search your house, said Holmes. I don't think you are, said Peters, who had heard policemen in the hall. Come in here, please, he called out to them. These men are in my house without permission. Help me to get rid of them. Holmes took out one of his cards. This is my name and address, he said to the policeman, and this gentleman is my friend, Dr. Watson. We know you very well, sir, said one of the policemen, but you can't stay here and search the house without a court order. Of course not. I realize that said Holmes. Take him to the police station, cried Peters. We know where to find this gentleman if he is wanted, said the policeman in reply. But you must go now, Mr. Holmes. That is the law. We went next to the hospital in Brixton. There we were told that two kind people had claimed a dying woman as a former servant of theirs and had received permission to take her away with them. We then went to see Dr. Horsum, who had looked after the old woman immediately before her death. I was with her when she died, he told us. Old age was the cause of death. There was nothing suspicious about it at all. Did you notice anything suspicious in the house? asked Holmes. No, only that Mr. and Mrs. Peters had no servants. That is unusual for people of their class. The doctor was unable to tell us anything more. Finally, we went to Scotland Yard. We were told that the court order allowing a search of the house would probably not be signed until next morning at about nine. Sherlock Holmes did not go to bed that night. He smoked for hours and wandered about the house. At twenty past seven in the morning, he rushed into my room. The funeral is at eight, Watson. It is seven twenty now and my thoughts on the Carfax mystery have only just become clear. We must hurry, if we are too late. In less than five minutes we were in a carriage, 
but it was twenty-five to eight as we went over Westminster Bridge and ten past eight when we arrived in Pulteney Square. Fortunately, the undertaker's men were also a little late, and we were in time to see them carrying the coffin out of the house. Holmes rushed forward. Take that coffin back, he cried, putting his hand on the chest of the first man to push him back into the hall. Take it back immediately. Then Peters appeared behind the coffin. His red face was very angry. Mr. Holmes, you have no right to give orders here, he shouted. Show me your court order. It is on its way, Holmes answered. This coffin must remain in the house until it comes. The firmness in Holmes's voice had its effect on the undertaker's men. Peters had suddenly disappeared, and they obeyed these new instructions. They put the coffin back on the dining room table. In less than a minute, we had managed to open it. As we did so, a strong smell of chloroform came out. There was a body in the coffin. The head was wrapped in bandages, which were still wet with the chloroform. Holmes unwrapped the bandages, and there was the face of an attractive middle-aged woman. He quickly lifted the body to a sitting position. Is she alive, Watson? Surely we are not too late. For half an hour, it seemed that we were. But in the end, our efforts to bring the lady back to life were successful. Her breathing returned. Her eyes began to open. A carriage had just arrived, and Holmes went to the window and looked out. Here is Lestrade with his court order, he said. But Peters the priest and Annie Fraser have already escaped, and here is a man who has a better right to nurse this lady than we have. Good morning, Mr. Green. I think Lady Frances should be taken away from here as soon as possible. Now the funeral may continue. The poor old woman at the bottom of that coffin can now be buried alone. I have been very stupid, Watson, said Holmes that evening. I knew that I had heard something important, but I did not know what it was until seven o'clock this morning. It was something the undertaker said to Annie Fraser. Our friend Green heard him say it. It took longer, the man said, than an ordinary one would take. Of course he was talking about the coffin. It was an unusual one. Its measurements were not the ordinary ones. It had been made specially. But why? Why? Then I suddenly remembered the deep sides and the thin little body at the bottom. Why had such a large coffin been made for such a small body? There could be only one explanation. It was to leave room for another body, the body of Lady Frances Carfax.